Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of Shy Hack Night. This is Shy Hack Night number 410. Uh, we're glad you could join us. My name is Joel Inwood, and uh, I'll be your host this evening, along with... Along with Eric Sherman. That's right. And tonight, we're very excited to be presenting uh, Chicago's 49th Ward Alderwoman, Maria Haddon. Um, but first, we have some, uh, some announcements to go through. Um, yeah, um, let's see. So we hope you'll stick around with us after the presentation for a live Q&A in the civic hacking portion of the evening. Um, and after the presentation, we'll also be taking your questions via the YouTube chat. So get your questions ready uh, or drop them right there in the chat whenever. And um, let's see, as a friendly reminder, our code of conduct will be enforced. So uh, check that out on the website, shyhacknight.org, if you haven't seen it already. Um, Eric, do you want to take the first announcement? Yes. OK. Um... So it looks like the first announcement is the upcoming presentations, um, which uh, is always exciting to see what is happening next. Last week, we got to be excited to see that Maria Hayden was going to be presenting. And this week, uh, we get to be excited to see that we've got uh, Elliot Ramos from WBEZ next week giving a presentation. Uh, and then in September, uh, we have some presentations too regarding uh, prison reform from uh, Maya Shenwar and Victoria Law. Uh, and then we've got Victor Covis presenting on accessibility and civic tech. Uh, so be sure to keep an eye out. You can uh, subscribe. We do send out email reminders. Uh, also, if you join our Slack channel, uh, you can always join the Shy Hack Night remote and uh, get pinged uh, whenever presentation is starting. All right, who needs some technology help? I think I do. Uh, let's see, Shy Hack Night is doing a, uh, a help desk now. It's open to nonprofits, um, uh, folks in uh, um, city government, uh, and uh, anyone else that you think might need help. Um, so uh, sign up at uh, bit.ly slash chn dash help dash desk. Um, or just go to our website, shyhacknight.org, and look at the blog, uh, and we'll uh, link it right there. Thanks. Okay. Um, so we've got an announcement here uh, that is just uh, considered a public service announcement. Um, this is something pretty cool that got on our radar that is out there. Um, you can see the website link here at the bottom. Um, probably also drop the link in Slack if you're curious. Um, but the DSAs helped put together this website called Find My Landlord, uh, which is uh, pretty interesting. You know, it, it helps you search the city of Chicago, kind of see what the sort of setup is with rental housing. Um, there are, you know, perhaps you could say many landlords and especially some landlords who own what might be considered to be, depending on your opinion, a lot of properties. Um, so feel free to explore that data and uh, have some thoughts about it for yourself. All right, um, new free internet eligibility form for Chicago public school students. Um, I just heard an announcement today that the city is gonna give away, if I'm not mistaken, another, uh, was it 3,600 devices? Um, so anyway, this, this program is good. Um, who knows what's going to happen this fall? So uh, go to cps.edu slash Chicago Connected um, to get more information on that. Um, also, speaking of things that are coming up uh, is elections. Um, there is a deadline to register to vote by mail, uh, which is, I would say, the recommended way to vote this election season. Um, the deadline is October 29th. Um, so if you live in Chicago, you're going to want to go to chicagoelections.gov. If you live in suburban Cook County, you're going to want to visit uh, the Cook County Clerk's page. Um, and if you're not sure where you live and but have a strong suspicion that it might be Illinois, go ahead and go to IllinoisVotes2020.com and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll get your head screwed back on straight. 
Um, yeah, that's all there is to say about that. The census. Uh, the census is so important for a wide variety of reasons, but I'm going to give you just one, money. The money we received from the federal government for all kinds of programs um, directly depends on your participation in the census. Then also representation. The uh, number of seats we have in the U.S. House of Representatives uh, may depend on how well folks do at filling out the census. So if you haven't done it already, this, this is the easiest thing ever. It just takes like a second. Um, go to my2020census.gov and fill it out. Uh, in their infinite wisdom, the Trump administration decided to uh, shorten the length of time you would have to complete your census this year by a month. That means it is due by the end of September. You have to do it. So just take a second, my2020census.gov, and uh, everyone thanks you. It's also a great way if you've forgotten the birthday of anyone that lives in your household and you're too embarrassed to ask. It's a great, great way to uh, have an excuse to ask for that information. Post-presentation Zoom call. Uh, so for intros and announcements and breakout groups um, and all these other fun hack night things, if you don't know what any of that is, it's also a good reason to join. Um, we're going to start at 8 o'clock a uh, post-meeting or a post-presentation Zoom. And that will be in um, HTTPS colon slash slash bit.ly uh, slash chn dash remote dash zoom. Um, and we're going to put that in the, uh, in the YouTube chat comments too, so you don't have to memorize it. All right, I think that is it for our announcements. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause for uh, Alderwoman Maria Hatton. Hey, good evening. Um, thank you for the intro. Thanks for, for the invite and having me on. And hello to everybody um, who is uh, attending the Hack Night. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So as I do so, um, my name is Maria Hatton, and I am uh, Alderwoman of the uh, 49th Ward. Um, if you're not familiar with the 49th Ward, we encompass most of what people think of as Rogers Park and bits of West Ridge. So we're the furthest northeast ward in the city. And um, if you're new to Chicago or not super familiar, um, there are 50 wards um, in the city. So let's make sure everything's set here. You guys let me know. Is my screen good to go? Looks good. Yes. Yes. All right. Fantastic. Um, so uh, really excited to be here. Um, I reached out to, uh, to Shy Hack Night uh, a couple of months ago and had a great conversation with Derek as myself, my, my staff, and uh, other folks that I've been speaking with in government have been really tackling um, this new challenge of what civic engagement under quarantine looks like. Um, being an older person, civic engagement is a part of our job. And there are 50 of us and we all do it a little differently. Um, but without a doubt, there's not a city council member in, in the city of Chicago um, that doesn't have some type of civic engagement outreach program and figuring out how we do this safely, how we connect with our residents um, and what that looks like both you know, during this time frame that we've gone through of that initial shock and shutdown but also what kind of plans and, and structure we're building for the future um, is on a lot of people's minds. So uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, kind of big pieces of this um, that, I, that struck me from, from the beginning as the months have gone on from uh, when we shut down my office in person, which was March 16th, um, there's this existential question, right? Uh, if I don't see my older woman, does she still exist? And so much of uh, Chicagoans' relationship with their aldermen, it's a pretty special thing. Uh, people reach out to us for everything and anything you can imagine. Um, maybe their garbage cart went missing or 
Um, there are rats in their alley, there are squirrels living in their roof, um, perhaps there's a neighbor dispute, um, or maybe they need help contesting a parking ticket. Um, maybe there was a shooting on their block or they're looking for housing or they're looking for work. Um, people come to us because they've got a business idea they're trying to start in, in the community. Um, I've spoken at like a you know neighborhood freedom school to a group of eight-year-olds um, and you know eighth grade graduations and high school graduations. Um, I even now uh, in the quarantine through Zoom have officiated vow renewals for residents in the ward. So um, how we relate to our residents and how our residents relate to us I think is a unique and, and fun thing. Um, but that being said, from, from legislation to lakefront erosion to COVID response, um, aldermen are typically the first and most accessible connection to city and other government institutions that residents have in the city of Chicago. In the best of times, um, people don't know half the things that we do um, or that our teams do, um, but we're always working hard for you. This pandemic and the changes that um, speaking for myself in the 49th ward that we've made um, to keep my team and myself safe, right? Closing down the office, doing remote operations and changing the ways that we, we do our work um, has posed some really interesting challenges for one of the most important aspects of my job and that is connecting with people. So um, many of you uh, may know, but I, I, maybe you don't, I'm in my first term in office. So I was elected in 2019 and sworn in and in, in May, um, but I spent the 10 years prior to my election and working in this role, um, working with other elected officials, local governments and community groups around the country to reimagine democracy and bring community centered process and decision-making to local government. My campaign slogan when I ran um, was community voice, community choice. All this is to say that one of my primary goals in office is to make government more accessible to people and to bring community voice to city council decision making. Up until the pandemic, every tool in my toolbox really revolved around in-person contact and virtual options and tech tools were supplementary and used primarily to drive people to in-person events. Um, so, you know, Monday through Friday, board office was open. Um, you know, I've got five staff members, people were there. I was frequently there, if not in city hall and committee meetings. We had weekly ward nights um, every Wednesday. We were open later and no appointment needed. People could drop in between five and seven and come and talk with me about whatever it is they wanted to speak to their aldermen about. Um, weekly newsletters that we would send out um, via email. I had monthly in-person town halls and then just a ton of community events, um, advisory meetings, we participatory budgeting, going to block parties, sponsoring festivals, just anything you can imagine. Pre-pandemic, this is how we saw people, right? Um, visibility and in-person contact is, is still the best way I know um, to connect with residents. But as I mentioned, my physical office has been closed and my team and I have been working remotely since March 16th. Um, early in the shutdown, right, our most pressing concern was communication. So getting as much reliable info about the coronavirus out to residents, businesses and organizations was kind of like the all hands on deck primary function. As the weeks passed, right, and that information cycle of how we were all learning new things about the coronavirus um, and then COVID-19, um, as that slowed down a little bit, um, we began to start experimenting with, you know, digital outreach and engagement, right, moving beyond just communication. Some of the things um, that we tried uh, and some things we adapted well and, and some of the things and tools that we use made work even more convenient. Um, other things uh, became nearly impossible to replicate. So in this time period of kind of late March through June, I did things like weekly YouTube live broadcast, right? Um, in lieu of the, the uh, weekly ward nights. Um, those weekly newsletters that we emailed out, we added a Spanish language newsletter um, to try and get more information to more people. Um, started doing more Facebook live updates, um, sharing those on Instagram and uh, did a, have done a lot more uh, commenting and comment engagement on social media 
especially on Facebook than I normally would. Um, I even started making TikTok PSAs. Um, so if you guys want to find the TikTok there, there's a few of them. I have TikTok's future hanging in the, in the balance there. We'll see how much more time I spend on it. Um, and then our remote operas operations. We switched from landlines to, to digital phones. We've got pretty advanced systems to do scheduling of who's doing phones and who's checking email. And then of course, a lot of Zoom meetings, right? Um, Zoom meetings all day long, not just for city council work, but also in engaging with our organization. So weekly um, meetings with local businesses, weekly meetings with um, folks in kind of real estate as we were monitoring um, what was happening uh, with rent and eviction processes, um, weekly meetings with community organizations and partners providing social service. Um, but the bottom line here is we have no in-person contact with residents. So some of the biggest barriers to engagement, right? And I think of this as this ladder is there's communication where we're just sharing information. Um, there's outreach that I, I talk about in how we're um, literally trying to um, figure out what people are interested in, bring more people into the fold and reach people who aren't already connected to my office. Um, and then engagement, really thinking of that as kind of our, our highest goal. So. Beyond some of the obvious restrictions that the pandemic um, brings, uh, there's also some pre-existing uh, barriers that we face in engagement work um, from the government side and in the 49th Ward. Um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar, the 49th Ward, as I mentioned, is mostly Rogers Park and Westridge, with some of the most diverse communities in the city of Chicago in every way possible, um, racially, ethnically, economically, languages spoken, age diversity, um, you know, homeowners and renters and, and where people um, come from as far as other backgrounds. Um, it makes for a beautiful ward and that diversity is a core part of our community identity, most definitely. And that also poses challenges to communication and engagement under the best of circumstances. So our, our language and cultural diversity, um, there are over 80 languages um, represented in the 49th Ward. Um, and regularly there's a core four to five languages um, that we frequently need to be able to communicate in. Um, the cultural diversity, people, we have a lot of immigrants. People have come from many different places. Um, we also, in that immigrant mix, we have a lot of refugees. And so we have whole communities of people um, who may have fled their country because of political persecution um, and don't necessarily, um, aren't, naturally inclined from their experience to want to engage with local government. And that's a bit of a challenge. Um, I mentioned we're 70% renters. Um, this was the first neighborhood I lived in when I moved to Chicago uh, 16 years ago. Uh, we've got Loyola University here um, being where we're located with our affordable housing historically and our ample supply of housing. Um, it's very common for this to be kind of a first neighborhood that people live in in Chicago but maybe they stay for, for two to three years and they move on. And so that cycle, um, because of our wonderful housing mix um, and accessibility with the transit, sometimes means that we don't easily connect to people who are not here for a long time. Digital literacy and access. Um, not everyone has the internet. Not everyone has reliable internet. And increasingly, whether it's for language access, economic reasons, or um, age reasons, um, some people just aren't as comfortable engaging in, in that digital online way. Um, and then I put on here, I'm following a 28 year incumbent. Um, and to this point, people who were connected to the previous alderman's office, um, he didn't pass on his, his mailing list to me um, or his email list. And so even it's been you know a, a year and a couple of months that I've been in office, um, people were used to engaging and connecting to their ward office in a certain way. Um, and following, following such a long pattern of behavior for longtime residents, that requires a little bit of change. Um, so communicating um, to people in a way that they best receive information, right? And the way people want to receive information and can understand it is challenging with such a diverse place. Um, and then keeping people engaged over time is even harder. So what does our engagement look like moving forward? We're gonna to continue to do what's worked, right? 
to communicate with residents, but we're also going to be adding in outreach activities to reach more people and ultimately support what is our highest goal, which is engagement. So there's no way around the fact that it's going to be more work. It's going to require more time and effort. And uh, I've even recently brought on a new part-time staffer um, who will solely be handling outreach and engagement um, with our residents because it's such a fundamental part, um, I believe, of a healthy aldermanic office. So some of the things that we're going to be continuing are those weekly newsletters, um, just in the informing piece. Um, those newsletters contain uh, personal updates from me on what's been happening, um, but they also contain opportunities for community engagement with my office and frequently outside of my office with other community organizations or city entities. Um, we'll continue the monthly virtual town halls and plenty of Zoom meetings, right? Um, that's still the, the quickest, most efficient and safest way um, that we found that we're able to um, meet the needs of holding special meetings or engaging residents around decision making. Um, things that will be increasing, um, again, is the social media engagement. Not everybody is on social media, not everybody is on every platform, um, but I've done my best to up my Instagram game um, and try and reach some of our younger demographics. Um, we'll be using more videos and just more of those easier ways um, where the more we use it, the more engagement we get and the more people we're able to connect um, in positive ways and having those discussions. And then a lot of the things that we're going to be adding um, are, are not necessarily new or, or tech related, but in order to reach people where they are, we're going to be going back to a lot of flyering. Um, we're going to be doing phone banking. Um, I've done a, you know, good old USPS mailing. We'll be doing more of those. We've also experimented with and we'll be using more SMS engagement and some limited physically distant outdoor engagements as well. Um, you know, in short, we're going to have to work harder and offer a wider range of options to connect. Um, you know, pre-pandemic could hold a host of community meetings for participatory budgeting. We might have five of them. We do a lot of flyering to get people out. Um, we could go out door knocking. I could talk to people face to face. Um, those things are time consuming, um, but you can reach a lot of people for the effort that it takes. And not having access to those things in a safe manner has really uh, given us cause to innovate. Um, so, you know, we've done some experimentation with the SMS and flyering engagement. That's how we're going to be doing a lot of our participatory budgeting process this year. Um, and I'm really hopeful that it'll help us reach more people and provide that, that presence um, that we're not able to do because I'm not able to show up in person to a lot of things. Um, so on that note, everything old is new again, right? Um, in my work with participatory budgeting in the PB project, um, I often talked about the, the paradigm shift in, in doing that work as we're bringing government to the people instead of just expecting people to come to government. And, um, you know, the tools and tactics that I taught and designed were pretty simple because outreach isn't rocket science. However, building a sustainable structure for communication, outreach, and engagement um, not only takes a lot of time and effort, but in this case, it's also going to take community support and participation. Um, so thank you all. Um, it's the end of my presentation for now. And um, I do want to say, um, if you're looking for me, um, here's where you can find me. So our office is still operating remotely, but we are using every tool um, at our disposal, uh, disposal to connect with people, to be available, and to meet with folks. So here are all the places you can find me um, if you've got questions, if you wanna connect, um, especially if you're a resident of the 49th Ward, but uh, even if you're not, thank you. All right, thanks. Let's see, so we got some, uh, we got some questions here in the chat. Uh, let me see, I'll start off. Um, one of the, uh, non-binding questions on our 2020 ballots of Chicago this fall is whether the city should act to ensure that all the city's community areas have access to broadband internet. Uh, if the answer is an overwhelming yes, what should the city do about it? I think that's a great question. Um, those non-binding resolution questions, um, this was my first year 
going through the process of having those available. And maybe that's a, a topic for a different show um, on what that process is like and how maybe we can use it a little more to our advantage. Um, there is no binding action tied to that. And during the um, committee meeting where we discussed these questions and um, got to hear from the particular sponsor of this question, which is actually Alderman Cardenas, um, uh, I think the overwhelming answer is going to be a yes. <laughs> um, I can't imagine anyone saying no to that question, um, but I, the actions that he explained he planned to take um, afterwards were um, a little more um, the in-depth studies of where we're lacking broadband access, what that infrastructure looks like, how we can work as a city to um, encourage um, internet service providers to build out more, especially um, as more of us are even like if everyone needed the internet before and we're even more reliant on it now. All right, thanks. Okay. So um, another question is uh, those of us who have gone to a lot of public meetings have probably noticed that the same few people can sometimes dominate the conversation. Uh, what are some strategies for letting the, those people have their say, but also making sure everyone has a chance to participate? And I might add on to this, like if you see that dynamic play out over social media or remotely as well. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is a, it's a great question because it's a super common occurrence, right? Um, we like to call them in my uh, old work, we talk about the usual suspects. Um, so the usual suspects, they're going to show up to every meeting, they're going to, you know, comment on every thread, sometimes it's usually topic specific. Um, and um, even well meaning, you know, even when they're well meaning, um, sometimes they can take up a lot of space. Um, so number one solution to this is actually really good facilitation. Um, so I can't tell you how many times in my previous role, um, I facilitated meetings, but also when we were designing participatory processes and coaching electeds and governments, um, it's very important that whether it be volunteers or staff that you've got facilitators and a facilitation plan. Um, the worst type of meeting and engagement, right, that you can have, whether it's Zoom or was in person, um, is one where the person holding the meeting just kind of lets the meeting run itself. Um, so being aware, knowing who's there, being mindful. Um, we set community agreements still at the beginning of a lot of the in-person meetings that I was doing um, pre-COVID. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say some of those things that I talked about is more convenient um, via digital platforms. That's one of them. Um, it's, a, it's actually a little easier to facilitate um, and kind of manage because you have a little more um, visibility on who's actually in your space. All right, thanks. We'll see. Uh, so as, uh, Chicago, as Chicago City Council has moved to run remotely, in what ways do you think it has improved the experience for residents? Uh, and do you see any of the changes as permanent post COVID? Hmm. Um, I know that one of the, one of the big improvements pre COVID, but in within this administration was actually just more consistent live streaming of the meetings as well as committee meetings. Um, and also, right, when that meeting's happening live and people are watching it via live stream, there's not necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily very engaging. Um, your, your tech setup and your cameras are different. Um, so, you know, you can see us all <laughs> um, with our digital operations, right? Uh, you get to see all our faces. Um, I dare say um, attendance has improved. Um, we're all showing up to more committee meetings. That's something that I notice personally. Um, I see more of my colleagues more consistently. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's a little, a, a little different feeling. Um, I've seen and noticed higher engagement in a lot of our committee meetings from my colleagues. Um, I don't know if there's an additional focus or with the just kind of very present, unavoidable thing of knowing people are watching and we're watching one another and we're all kind of all in this space um, that that lens. Um, there were definitely a, a few hiccups. And I, I think that 
it might be harder for people who are engaging in public comment, um, right? So you have to kind of sign up, you have to call in, you have to navigate the digital platforms and that can be challenging. Whereas previously all you had to do was show up in person. Um, however, um, you know, I still think sometimes the time in which we have our meetings is a little off-putting and excludes a lot of participation from people and that hasn't changed. Um, though we're meeting via Zoom and, uh, you know, digital platforms, um, we're kind of maintaining the time, the same time schedules, like 10 a.m. for city council meetings, and that's frequently a 9 or 10 a.m. start for a lot of committee meetings as well. Um, but that's something that perhaps moving forward could change. Um, one thing we haven't discussed, but I certainly would champion in the future, is continuing to have a digital engagement option, um, even when in-person meeting is available. Um, I, I think having that kind of hybrid would help to um, increase participation, um, could give us a little bit more flexibility as well as older people. Right, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, kind of reminds me of an unruly class and all of a sudden the teacher is like paying attention to every person. So they got to You can see everybody's up. face. Yeah. Um, so we have got one question from one of our, uh, one of our viewers. Uh, what sort of staff do you have helping you do community engagement? Hmm. Um, so I've got um, a chief of staff, a director of constituent services, a constituent services coordinator, um, two of them actually that are part-time, and then um, also uh, another full-time person who's our director of um, uh, community development um, and uh, community and economic development. Um, we just brought on a, a brand new, she started yesterday, uh, another part-time staffer specifically to work on outreach and engagement. So pre-COVID, this was kind of in the works. It was something that I was looking at for the mid-year mark, um, knowing that it's important work and we're over, award offices are always overloaded with constituent services. So when you're trying to do robust engagement like participatory budgeting or participatory planning decisions, um, that means all of your staff end up doing all of the things. Um, and uh, being able to bring on somebody who can specialize in something like outreach and engagement, um, which is what I've done, is great because she'll be supporting everybody else's work um, when it comes to the outreach and engagement piece. So that's what our staffing looks like for it um, as of this week. And is there support, this is another question mm -hmm. that uh, is related, I would say. Um, another uh, viewer was watching it, asking if there's support from city government on facilitating your outreach. So like, it sounds like you're able to have budget for people on staff for you, but is there also like help from the rest of the city government? Uh, no. <laughs> no, no is the short answer. How, how efficient. Uh, yeah. Um, so aldermanic offices, um, really, uh, aldermen get to run their own office. Um, and there are pros and cons to that. Um, so some of the challenges can be, and this is like from my civic engagement work, um, I worked with about 13 different aldermanic offices over a like eight year period in supporting their participatory budgeting processes. And every office is different. We, um, you know, we all get a budget for three full-time staffers. And then we have an expense budget um, that's meant to cover kind of our rent, um, doing business in our office utilities, and a lot of folks hire part-time staffers from that budget as well, which I do. Um, and, but like what we do, how we do it, what those titles are, what training staff get, um, that's all dependent on what the older person wants to do. Um, so in that respect, there isn't a central staffing support for older people to do any of the community engagement or ward work. There's some central support. There's a small group of free staffers that work on legislative issues um, that council members have access to, but that's it. Um, and with that being said, every department in the city, right, has some kind of outreach component, um, mm -hmm. some staff that do that work, and they're always more than happy to work with aldermen, um, but that's 50 aldermen to support. They're doing the support work of their department, supporting their own teams, um, and so I still think it's a fairly limited resource available 
um, when you think of an older person wanting to do that kind of robust engagement. All right, thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, so someone asks, uh, do you have concerns about heavy reliance on social media for outreach considering um, virus and election misinformation, uh, as well as privacy and mental health uh, issues? Um, absolutely, like social media for outreach can't, it can't be your only thing, right? Um, it's been very difficult, right? Um, that's like, you know, one of the challenges is for a while having to rely on that. That's why, um, you know, I did um, a mailing, I wanna say it was in June, um, I did a mailing from my office to about 19,000 households, which was all the addresses I had available. Um, you know, even though there are, you know, about 55,000 people in the ward. Um, so access to information and how we reach people is another huge issue, right? Um, so I did a like 19,000 household mailing with, hey, here's the ward office staff, here's our phone number, here's our email, here's how you can reach us, you know, here's an update on my first year in office. Um, and that cost about 10 grand mm. um, to, do, to do like a two page front and back mailing. I shared information on our Rogers Park community response team as well. Um, I don't have the budget to do mailings very regularly. Um, don't have the money to do those on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, I mentioned a couple of tools like flyering and SMS outreach. Um, so we tested out around the Juneteenth holiday, actually, um, some targeted flyering and checking in um, with some engaging questions for folks that they could text to a short code um, to kind of see like, hey, if I put up some flyers with a short code from my office and ask folks like what they thought about something, what would the response be like? And it was moderately, like it was, you know, better than I hoped for, not as great as I, not as great as I fully wanted. Um, but that's one of the structures that we're going to be using that kind of combo of a lot more flyering um, for some key updates, um, concise information, engaging questions, SMS outreach, QR codes, and inviting people to kind of participate. Um, and on the social media front, um, one, you're not gonna access everybody. We don't have a lot of control. Um, the algorithms dictate our lives, right? Um, and kind of what we see and who sees what. And um, yeah, uh, to the, the question, to the person's point about mental health issues, um, I try to limit my social media time. Um, it's certainly not always a healthy space. Um, and even in kind of the positive comments and things that you get, um, there's so much input so much input and so much information it can be overwhelming i know a lot of people who take breaks from social media and so yeah it can't be the only space for outreach um, and sometimes it can be a pretty toxic environment especially for an elected official yeah um so another question uh do you so we kind of talked about how this there's not a ton of support from the city in a coordinating way for outreach, but do the uh, council members themselves come together to share tactics? Like, do you meet with other older people to share tactics on effective outreach? Um, absolutely. Um, so within our caucuses, but also just with my neighboring older people, um, right? So we have ward boundaries and these political jurisdictions are not the way people, most people live their lives. Um, so, you know, I keep in good communication with the 50th Ward, 40th Ward, and 48th Ward older people as well, um, because things that are, you know, Rogers Park expands beyond the 49th Ward, um, Westridge expands, expands beyond the 49th Ward, um, people live, work, shop, you know, have their kids go to school in all kinds of overlapping spaces. Um, so that's probably the, the large, like the, the most frequent communication around those kind of practical things of, um, like when the tornado hit us last week, which a tornado hit our neighborhood last week, and I'm still I'm still dealing with that. Um, but it hit the 50th ward pretty hard too, right? Because it just came straight uh, east, and so a lot of communication between the 49th and the 50th ward um, because the things people are experiencing there are important. Um, and then with some of my other freshman colleagues, um, we definitely um, spend some time talking about and asking questions about how are you connecting or. What are you doing around this issue? Um, so it is nice to have a peer group and people to, to speak with. 
All right. So uh, we got another question uh, from the chat. Uh, so to double check, uh, how will your phone banks determine who to call? Oh, um, so that that depends. Um, so a couple things. Um, what we've done so far was working with the Rogers Park Community Response Team. Um, we actually did phone banking specifically for senior citizens um, in the ward um, at the beginning, right? We spent several weeks calling folks and doing just kind of wellness checks, like, hey, you know, we're calling from the older woman's office and we're checking on you and do you know how to reach us? And there's that. And so with that, we were able to use voter file list. Um, but as I mentioned before on the mailing list, the access to the information that I have for the list to even begin with, they're already filtered. Um, so the most comprehensive uh, access that I have are to voter file lists. Mm. Um, we, the city doesn't give us like a list of everybody that lives. We don't have that kind of registration or database. Um, so the other thing that I rely on is people opting in. Um, when it comes to the phone banks that I'm proposing, um, some of the conversations that I've had with neighbors really look more like actually building localized phone trees. Um, so mm -hmm. really in that kind of uh, everything old is new again, I'm talking about phone trees, talking about getting people like in their building <laughs> to get their neighbor's phone numbers and to make a list. Maybe they can put it in a, in a Google Doc um, so that they have information and access to call and that they're, you know, maybe they don't want to share all of that information with my office, but maybe we can get a point person in each building. Um, so that when there's something really important or folks need to get a hold of, hey, great, you know what, could you call these 10 people? Um, so when I talk about the phone banks, um, that's more the level that I think we need to get to. Um, and that's some of our goals on the longer term outreach. Great. Um, so more questions from the chat. Um, pivoting back to mental health a little bit, uh, we had some questions wondering if there are uh, mental health centers available in your ward and kind of along those lines, uh, if there's community outreach available in your ward, uh, how you've dealt with like increases of depression and anxiety uh, that people have been experiencing uh, during, uh, you know, everything that's been going on with the pandemic and, and everything else that's been happening in the city. Yeah, um, so I'd say one of, the, one of the first things we did um, uh, even before, before um, we shut down physical operations at my office was um, uh, one of my friends and residents, Jim Jindersky, we were sitting in the office. This was like the week of March 11th and um, with my chief of staff, Leslie Perkins and our director of uh, community development, Torrance Gardner. And um, we're like, this is gonna get bad and this is gonna get scary and we need some kind of community response team. Um, so um, I'll say um, rpcrt.org um, is the website. And for you guys, I'll put it here. Um, so you don't have to wonder what I was spelling. Um, stands for Rogers Park Community Response Team um, org. So that's a website where we actually have a lot of resources. Um, and we worked to compile um, with volunteers as much information as possible right from the start. And on there, if you go to resources, um, there's also a tab on emotional support and mental health hotlines. Um, so that was definitely identified early on as something that was gonna be a need. Um, so there's some, some national things there, right? There's some Chicago resources. Um, and this is, you know, if you call my office or if you call the response team, these are the groups we refer you to. Um, more locally, we do have a couple great community service organizations um, like Trilogy Behavioral um, Services, um, Annex or Center, um, and Thresholds um, that work with folks. Um, Trilogy has uh, a, a clinic on site and there were services that were closed during the pandemic, um, but they were still doing checks. Um, so we do have some local resources um, for folks who will do wellness checks, who will go out and you know make a phone call um, so if you're concerned about someone, right, if there's somebody that you would like to have a check performed on, um, you know, it's, it, we're lucky to have those resources available. It's good to hear. 
<clears throat> so another person asks, how can tech savvy folks help their other persons with community engagement and other efforts? I'm a data scientist and I'd love to volunteer somehow. I'm in the 49th ward. This is Trisha Scully. Oh, fantastic. Um, we would love you to volunteer and help us. So as I mentioned, um, I think there's a lot to be said for, for kind of data and information management and, and you know, um, thinking about systems. So I mentioned, you know, in some communications with residents, people want a way to communicate with one another and they want better ways to communicate with my office. Now we've got email and we've got phone and that's great. Um, but you know, what if, you know, on this is real life situations. What if I need to have a meeting with folks in a building? Um, right now, I set up a Zoom meeting. I dealt this today actually, spent some time um, with residents. We had a shooting recently in the neighborhood and an area around Chase and Damon. Um, several residents in the area reached out um, with a lot of concern. So we're like, great, they wanna meet, fantastic. We set up a Zoom meeting for them. Um, and several of them were very upset at a Zoom meeting. Um, they wanted an in-person meeting. And I'll tell you as uh, we're gonna have the Zoom meeting and I told them we could also meet in person, but um, being able to have, um, as we gather more information and kind of build those networks, having some kind of system and way to manage that um, having people that can think about data security, right? That's not, that's not my focus. That's not my strong suit. Um, and certainly I think a lot of ward offices would probably need help and in, in people with experience thinking about that. Um, and then there's also um, a lot of community things that, that pop up. Um, I'll mention the response team, community response team again, that's volunteer led and organized. And so there might be some opportunities there as well. Um, so definitely um, email me at the office at 49th and um, kind of reference shy hack night and we'll we'll put you to work i will also plug that uh we've mentioned again that shy hack night has a help desk where there are forms that can be submitted and uh our very own uh uh andre uh Andres, Andres, uh, 40th word you may have heard of him um <laughs> he, he's also like reached out so I, some members of us who are part of the help desk are going to be talking to him more around constituent services but i think kind of along the lines of a lot of these things we've been talking about you know there is this like historic precedent in chicago for each office to kind of be its own little island but there's probably ways that we can reuse some of those efforts across interested parties and, and I'll say, um, I got really hung up on, you know, my needs in the 49th ward, um, but for other wards um, to kind of answer that part of the question, there are, um, there are a lot of wards that don't have uh, an email newsletter, right? Or, um, and, and it's not because they're not capable of doing it, but there are different wards and different residents communicate in different ways. Um, so there are wards and communities where, you know, they're doing paper newsletters or they're used to being able to really directly engage in person with their aldermen, um, where maybe they're doing um, robocalls or other types of things or door knocking or they're engaging through a community center. So there are definitely wards who have different needs, um, but knowing that there's usually a tech solution to help augment um, anything that we're doing in person but folks who might not have as much, uh, maybe a lot of their residents, you know, aren't as internet or tech savvy, maybe they are even more language barrier issues um, or other tech issues. Um, we have different resources um, and like kind of infrastructure resources as well. And so I'd say if you live in a ward where you're, you notice your older person doesn't really have a digital presence, they might need your help um, in kind of adapting and growing and you should reach out. Awesome. Um, well, we have time for just one more question, uh, which I think is a very great question from Rebecca Jones. She wants to know your personal recommendation for what city public meetings would you recommend people join in and watch? What meetings are available to the public where we can hear the city council debating? It sounds like they really want to see the see the sausage get made. Um, well, you could have turned it. You could have tuned in to pretty much any of our city council meetings once we started on Zoom, because they were all super hot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, 
there were there were uh, we don't necessarily get into all the parliamentary antics that you see over in the UK, um, but we certainly had a string of city council meetings where there was there was some drama. Um, but on a more serious note, um, the I'd recommend anyone tuning into city council, but you won't see a lot of debate there. Um, so mostly if you're tuning into a city council meeting, um, what you'll see is there might be a resolution or a special topic that is at the top of the meeting. And then you're going to hear committee reports. Those committee reports are going to be really brief. They're going to be a committee chair reading an agenda item and what the recommendation was, was from committee. Um, and the off chance that there is a controversial item, there might be some debate and comment from the floor, um, but that doesn't happen more often than not. So where you really wanna tune into are the committee meetings. Um, so if you wanna follow city council, things that you should look for are after the city council meeting, um, you need to familiarize yourself with this website, shycityclerk.com. Um, so shycityclerk.com, that is the website of our uh, city clerk, Ana Valencia, and it's where you're gonna find all the records for legislative things. So usually the day by the day after council, you'll be able to go there. You can look by meeting and you can look to see what legislation was introduced. Um, so you can see, great, all right, in the August meeting, which we don't have an August meeting, the next meeting is September 9th. Um, by September 10th, you should be able to log in, look to see what legislation was introduced, find some things that you might be interested in, and then it'll tell you which committee it's going to so you know which committee meeting you want to tune into. Um, other tips, it's going to have a list of sponsors and it's going to have the chief sponsor. Um, so if there's a piece of legislation that you're like, ah, this is very interesting. Um, you know, I want to learn more about police accountability. Um, you know, where's that legislation at? Great. Who is the chief sponsor? That could give you an indication of other than your alderman, the alderman that you might want to reach out to to have more information you're also gonna be able to see, okay, well, that was introduced to this committee on public safety. Who's the chair of the committee on public safety? When is this item going to actually come to a meeting? Um, because just because something was introduced in July doesn't mean that it's going to be on like the next meeting agenda. Um, so the chairs get to decide um, what is on the agenda and when it's heard. Uh, but those would be the starting points I'd say Tune into city council if you don't want to watch the whole thing. Check shy city clerk afterwards. Find legislation that you're interested in. Follow up with the chief sponsors. Follow up with the chairs. And then look for when that committee meeting is going to be scheduled. And note that they have to post a notice of that committee meeting and the agenda 48 hours before the meeting. So hope that helps. Oh, that's great. I got my, uh, I guess I'm viewing for September I can get set up for. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for coming, and um, yeah, that was really good. All right. Thank you guys for having me. Anytime. You're welcome back. <laughs> All right. We are going to switch into our post-presentation mode for the evening. Um, we have a Slack where the Shy Hack Night folks do an awful lot of communication. That is located at uh, Slack Me dot shyhacknight.org that's s-l-a-c-k-m-e dot shyhacknight.org and uh, we're about to start a zoom where we can all get to know each other um, and that address is right there on your screen that is bit.ly slash chn dash remote dash zoom um, so come meet us there in uh, just a minute and uh, tonight's broadcast will be uh, posted in a few days or maybe less on uh, YouTube. So you can check it out there. Um, Eric, what am I forgetting? I think the last thing that we have to say is uh, stay safe, take care, and, and go, go forth, forth and, and back. back. <laughs> Good night, everybody.